Thank you for being part of the Oakwood Free Will Baptist Church Ministries. Our prayer is that those who listen to the Word of God will find a greater revelation of God's purpose in their lives. For additional resources, please visit us on the web at www.oakwoodfwb.com. Today, may you be encouraged, strengthened, and refreshed by our message. This morning, we want to thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, you are so good. And uh, Lord, I know that a lot of times we have things that happen in our lives that, that are not what we would want. Uh, but Lord, we know that no matter what the situation is in our lives, that you are with us every step of the way. And Lord, we want to thank you for that. You said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God, we know that that peace that you give that passes all understanding will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So Lord, I pray this morning for each and every need that's been mentioned. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that for those things that even we could not speak of this morning, the unspoken request that's on our hearts, Lord, you know where each person is, you know where each family is, and you know the needs that are there. And God, we pray that you'd meet those needs according to your, your will. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be what we need to be for Christ. Lord, I know the Bible tells us that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Lord, no matter what we go through, you give us the power and the ability to cope with whatever we need to cope with. And Lord, our hope, our trust, our help, everything that we have is in you. And uh, Lord, even not only the fact that you created us, but we live and breathe, we have our being because of you. And Father, we thank you for that this morning. We pray that you would bless each and every need that's been mentioned, whether it be physical needs, spiritual needs, or we lift these needs up to you. And we know that you hear, and we know that you answer these requests. So we pray you do that. And Lord, be with us in this class this morning. I pray you draw us to yourself. Lord, help us to be more than what we are for the cause of Christ. I pray in his name. Amen. 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 All right. I forgot. I got to put one more, uh, mark one more down. And that will give us another one. All right. And hopefully, um, hopefully we can get into the lesson this morning. I, I will say this. Go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter 4, if you will. We're going to read this verse again. Jeremiah chapter 4. And, um, and again, this morning uh, we're talking about what God does with broken things, particularly broken people. And um, by the way, last week we didn't get very far, and that's because Miss Dixie kind of brought up a question. And by the way, I'm very thankful that she did. I think Miss Dixie's the one that brought the question up. Um, if there are any any questions that you guys have, even if it doesn't pertain to Maybe I shouldn't say this because Miss Dixie's always got questions uh, that doesn't pertain to the lesson. Uh, certainly, we want to look at those and we want to talk about them because the reason that we're here it's not it's not to to for you to hear what I've got to say necessarily. But if there are questions on your mind and on your heart, um, you know, we certainly want to try to do the best we can to answer those questions uh, in regard to the Bible and things that pertain to life and godliness and that kind of thing. So, um, but with that, yes, ma'am. <laughs> What? what do you do when you see friends falling away from God, hardening their hearts towards Scripture? What do you do? Yes. I think Did that pertain to today's lesson. Well, I think it. Yes, I think it could. I think it could because you know people broken. They're broken. They're hurt about something. They're you know kind of falling away from their faith. Uh, so yeah, I think that definitely would have something to do with it. There, there are a couple of things you do. Number one. You don't give up on them. Uh, and believe you me, there is, there is one right now that's on my heart and mind. There are a number of people, but there's one particular that's on my heart and mind right now that I have prayed for probably more than I've prayed for anyone else uh, in my life. And, um, you know, there's a sense, sometimes there's a tendency for us to want to say, oh, well, you know, this person is, um, you know, they're kind of too far gone and there's nothing that God can do to get their attention and, you know, whatever. But I don't think that's true. Um, God doesn't give up on us, even though sometimes we give up on ourselves. And, um, you know, one of the hardest things to do, I think, in life is when you, particularly the Christian life, is when you mess up, when you do something you shouldn't, you fall away. It, it's very difficult to pick yourself up by the bootstraps 
and to keep on keeping on. You know, rather than that, there's a tendency to want to say, man, I failed God, I've done wrong, I did this, or I had this kind of attitude, and you know, you just, you're ashamed of yourself, and sometimes people think that God can't forgive them, or God, you know, is not going to forgive them for what they've done. And that's simply a misconception, because the Bible says God is long-suffering. Uh, particularly for those who are not saved, he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But I think there's also the principle there that, you know, as we think about 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God knows we're going to fail. God knows we're going to mess up. And so his forgiveness is constantly there for us. And, and we need to remind them of that. You know, hey, and, and I know there are some people that don't want to admit that they've messed up. You know, their pride creeps in, and that's something God hates is pride. But cr pride creeps in, and then they think, oh, well, I didn't really do anything that bad. You know, so it depends on what that person is feeling, you know, as it, to how you're going to go about helping them get to back to where they are, where they need to be, uh, I should say. Well, they, it seems like... Like this friend of mine in Colorado, they want to choose and pick the scripture that they want to believe in. Okay. That, in other words, that they're saying, well, God couldn't mean this here, but right. I think he meant this here. And see, that's the problem. You see, it's not, when you're talking about the Bible, it's not what we think. It's not what I think that's important. I mean, I can tell you, well, I think this or I think that. If the scripture doesn't say it, it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what God says. And there are, there are certain things in the Bible that it may be unclear. And so rather than saying, well, I think this, the best thing to do is to say, okay, it's not real clear on this, so I don't know, you know, I'll find out one day when I get to heaven what this is. You know, right now, the Bible says that as we think about this life, that we see like through a glass darkly. You know, it's almost like if you ever, um, and maybe you haven't, but if you ever like got a glass of water and you've, you know, you put sweet tea in it or, or in a, in a glass, you put sweet tea in it or whatever. If you've got a glass of water, you can look through that water and see pretty much anything. It's, it's a little clouded because it's kind of disoriented as you look through that glass with the water in it. But it's almost like you, in this life, you've poured a, a glass of tea into a glass and you look, trying to look through it and you can't see things really well. Okay, it's kind of what God's given us an example of. In this life, we see through a glass darkly. We can't see what's down the road, and we we can't understand what God is trying to do in our lives. But then the Bible says one day we're going to see Him face to face, and we will know these things. So you know we've got a lot of questions today. Uh, the Bible is very clear about a lot of things, but some things it's not. And uh, the the thing we we want to do is we want to question God why this or why that. And I don't think God's intimidated with our questions. I don't think he, he's upset with our questions. But I think also we need to be remind ourselves that those things that God is not clear on, we need to take them by faith. And just say, hey, God, one day I'm going to know. Right now I'm not. And the reason I don't is because I'm not God. And if I were God, then God wouldn't be God. And so, you know, and I'm not saying that to kind of shove off the questions we may have, but I'm just simply saying that's just the way things are. Um, well, see, she expects her pastor to know everything. And I don't think any of us know it, everything. No. Even if you went to school your whole life, I don't think you'd have the answer no. to everything in this book. No, there's no way. Uh, and it's kind of like I say all the time, when you read the Bible, you know, I've, I read a passage the other day that I've probably read a hundred times. And I read that passage and one word just boom popped out. And I'm thinking, I never saw that before, even though I've read it a hundred times. And so God is constantly teaching us new things from his word. The problem is, you know, we, we, let, we let ourselves come into church. We let ourselves get in the book for a number of reasons. I think the, the most important reason is because we love God and because we want to know more about him. But what happens is God allows things to happen in our lives that will wake us up. And, and by the way, I mean, ultimately, you know, our love for God, our love for Christ ought to motivate us to read the book. But when things, certain circumstances happen in our lives, we think, man, why is this happening? What have I done? I've messed up. And then we start getting in church and we start getting in the word. 
The truth is, whatever it takes to get you in church and get you in the Word, that's, that's the important thing. But really, we need to get to the point from, okay, I'm here because of something bad happened in my life. I'm reading the book. I'm praying because I'm seeking God and I need God's help. We need to get to the point where we do all of that, not because of what we're going through, but because of the blessing that God has given us and the love that we have for Him. Paul even said it like this. It's the love of Christ, and the word is used in the King James as the word constrain. The love of Christ constrains me, but really the word constrain means motivates. When you look at it in the, in the Greek, it's the word motivates. So the love of Christ motivates me to do everything that I do or not to do the things that I shouldn't do. It's all about loving Christ. And why do we love Him? The Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. So, you know, really everything that motivates us in this life, whether it is our jobs, whether it is our church life, whether it's our home life, everything that motivates us should center around, hey, I'm a child of God. Because I'm a child of God, here's the things that I do. Here are the things that I don't do. And, you know, it's not, it's very hard. I'll just give you this example because this is what hits home to me. I remember when Tina and I got married. Um, I thought, man, I'm going to be the best husband in the world. I mean, I really did. I thought, man, I, I am there. You know, man, she's really lucked up getting me for a husband. I mean, you know, that's, I'm serious. That's just kind of the way I thought about it because I thought, there's no one that's going to love her anymore. There's no one that's going to be more sensitive than I am. There's no one that's going to try to, you know, help her be the woman of God that she wants to be more than I am. I mean, I just, you know, I didn't ever say that to her, but in my mind, that's what I was thinking. And then you get married and you think everything is going to be, you know, roses and everything is going to be just smooth and no problems. And, you know, we're going to get along about everything and there's not going to be any arguments about anything. And, and I will say this, you know, Marriage is a hard thing. It is. It is hard when you bring two people together that has not been together before, and you have to work through all the things that you work through. And, you know, and, and it's, it's very difficult. It's the same thing. You think about your relationship with God. Your relationship with God is not an easy thing. It takes work. Just like having a good marriage takes work. It takes work being a follower of Christ. And so God has not called us to do easy things. God has called us to be faithful to him. Uh, and so, uh, and I probably kind of forgot where I was going with that because I was back and forth. But anyway. Uh, but don't you think God reveals scripture to you at the time that you need it? Absolutely. And that's why you said you can read a verse over and over and over again. And two years down the road, something hits you about that verse. Yes. And but, it's like he opens your eyes to it. But the important thing is that you're in the book. I mean, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free is what the Bible says. I so just did that today. If, if, you, yeah, if you don't know the book, then how is God going to bring it back up to you later? Right. You know what I'm saying? And so, and it's not an easy thing to read the Bible sometimes because of all the things that's going on around us and, you know, things that occupy our time, you know, and I'll be honest with you, I am not, and I hate to even admit this, but I am not a big reader. This book, I read more than anything else, and that's because it's God's Word. If it were not God's Word, I probably wouldn't be reading it because I'm just not into reading all that much uh, other than the Bible, and, and I read it all the time. But what I do is, and some of you got these smartphones, so I actually showed this to Tim the other day. Um, if, you, if you look on your, well, you, if you go to your apps and you look up this app, it's called Uversion Bible. Y'all have that? I know Tim got it the other day. Um, but one of the cool things is I can tap on this and I can say read. I can come up here. Now let's just say I want to go to the book of Acts chapter 1. I can go to Acts chapter 1. There it is. And then what I can do is right up here, you can hit that little button and you can hit play. And it reads to you. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. So... Tammy's phone does that all the time when we're on our way to Vanderbilt. <laughs> so what, I said all that to say this. Even though you may not be able to read, if you've got one of these phones that's got the Bible app on it, it'll read it to you. And I can be driving down the road, and I can be hearing the Bible being read. You know what I'm saying? So 
And, and there are CDs out there. There are tapes, and, well, it used to be tapes. I guess there's still tapes out there somewhere on the Bible. But there's CDs on the Bible where you can put that in at home and you can listen to the Word of God. And even though you may not be the best of readers and you may not like to read, man, it can, the Bible can be read to you all day long. And you can take the Scripture in that way. And so, uh, anyway, whatever it takes to get the Word of God in, that's what we need to do. Because... Everything that we need as it pertains to life and godliness is found in the Word of God. So whatever we can do to get the Word in us, the more of the Word you take in, the less you're going to sin. Hey, that rhymed, didn't it? The more of the Word of God you take in, the less you're going to sin. I didn't mean to do that this morning, but anyway, this rhymed. And, and that's true because David said in Psalm 119, I think verse 11, he said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So whether it is your own personal life or whether it's you want to be a better husband or a better wife or a better mother or father or whatever, you take the Word of God into your heart and then God helps you to live right and to do right. You know, there are people that deal with anger all the time. That would be me. Um, no. <laughs> no, Miss Dixie, that's everybody. You know, because to be honest with you, it doesn't take much to get somebody ticked off, generally. Now. Some people, you know, they're like a, a short fuse, you know, like a stick of dynamite. You light it, boom, they blow up, okay? And then you've got some that may be a stick of dynamite, but they got a fuse from here over to the activity building. And so it takes a lot for the, to get to the point where they blow up. But everybody deals with anger on a certain area, in a certain area and to a certain degree. The, the issue is this. If we get the Word of God in our hearts, we hide the Word of God in our hearts, then I'm not saying you're never going to get angry again, but I promise you it will help you deal with anger. Because when you hide God's Word in your heart, and every time there's a temptation for you to blow up at somebody, you're thinking, man, I just read that passage right there, and it says that we're to love Be everybody. Still. Yeah, or something like that. You know, Be still and know that I am God. I mentioned that in, in the uh, men's prayer breakfast this morning. And uh, I'm going to tell you what, Jimmy was such a blessing this morning uh, in men's prayer breakfast. I mean, it was, it was a really, really good devotional. Uh, it's, I think, something that we all needed because I think what it did is it brought, as men of God, it kind of brought us together uh, even more so than usual, and it kind of helped us talk about and get some things out, uh, and I think that's important too. Um, you know, and the Bible even says, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. And so it's important. What we're doing this morning is important because we're getting around the Word of God and we're talking about the things of God, and it helps us sharpen each other. Uh, in that so you know what I'm finding this year more than any other time is when I get into my word and I do it every day I'm more excited and it seems like people around me are more excited yeah. and I don't know why you know because I read the word all the time and I haven't been this excited since I first became a true believer yeah and so it's just awesome. Well, what, what the awesome thing about it is, Ms. Dixie, is this. You know, you take this book, which is God's love. It literally is a love letter to us from God. And so when you read this book and then God speaks to you, you see, God speaks to us in a couple of ways. We speak to him in prayer, through prayer. God speaks to us through his word and through his spirit. And so when you read the word of God and God takes that word and he opens your eyes to things that you've just read about your life personally, man, it, there's nothing like that feeling in the world. You know, and so and the, the thing is, Satan would desire to take the word of God and to, to cast it, in other words, for it to be cast on stony ground to where it's not going to take root. And what we've got to make sure is that we allow the word of God to take root in our heart and that it will produce what God wants it to produce in our lives. Otherwise, we're going to live a broken life, and that's where we were supposed to be in Sunday school lesson this morning. You know, we, but the thing is, and this is something else I mentioned in men's prayer breakfast, is that Jesus himself, and I, I don't think I've still got it. Maybe I've got it still on my phone. Um, let me see real quick. I looked it up this morning, and I, I was, yes, I do. Um, this comes from, um, well, I look forward to our morning Bible study on the text phone every morning. This comes from Luke chapter 5. Yeah, but you can't hear it. Listen to what it says. In Luke chapter 5, 
Uh, I had looked it up on my phone because I had shared it with, uh, with Floyd because he was mentioning a, a coworker that, that he was having some problems uh, with and uh, something that this coworker said, which was actually this coworker evidently is a pastor, uh, part-time pastor, bivocational, and he made the statement something like, well, we don't want those kind of people in my church. We want these kind of people in my church. We don't want those kind of people in my church. And here's what I shared with him. I said, um, uh, this is in, um, what did I say, Luke? Luke chapter, five. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 30. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician. That is, those people that are fine physically, they don't need a physician. A physician. But they that are sick. And then he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In other words, the church is full of sinners. And that's why we're here. We're not perfect. We need God. We need the things of God in our life. We need the Word of God in our life. We need God to help us with not only our personal lives, but our family's lives and, you know, and all these things. I mean, that's why we're here. Folks, I am not perfect. You know, people look at the pastor and think the pastor's perfect. I'm not. I need this just as much as you do. Even though God speaks to me about what I'm supposed to preach on and give, listen, God speaks in my heart way before he does yours because I study it first. And so I need this just as much as you guys do. You think about coming to church and fellowship. This morning, I am in tears because I get the chance and the, and the, the blessing of being around men of God and women of God, obviously, this morning. But I'm just saying over there, particularly, we're not invited. Well, that's why it's a men's group and a women's group. So we've got two different groups going on. Uh, there are times, I actually mentioned something about that this morning, didn't I tell you about Miss Dixie saying she wanted to be there. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, but you know, we need to be together because we strengthen one another. Iron sharpens iron. I mean, we strengthen and sharpen each other uh, as we fellowship together and as we learn the Word of God together. And um, so, you know, we need that. We do. Um, like example of the redwoods that I used at, at, at the beginning. Redwood trees are huge trees, but their root systems only go six to ten feet from the ground. Yeah. So they intermingle, and in this setting, it's all of us Christians need to intermingle together to stand as one and, and not become complacent, but always intermingle and stand as one. And, Praise God for well, all our blessings. And the Bible even mentions that a, a uh, let's see, a strand that, it's not a single strand, it's a multi-stranded cord that holds together stronger. It's what the Bible talks about. And I can't remember exactly how it's worded, but anyway, the, the basic thing is this. If I were to take a, a piece of, um, oh, what is it called? What do you, what do you sew with? Thread. thread. If I were to take a piece of thread, and I were to wrap it around my two fingers and go pop, I could break it pretty easily. Because uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. When you're sort of sewing and you want to get it, you go and then pop it, you know, it pops loose. But if you take four or five of those. Now do a nylon thread. Okay. Well, anyway, if you take several of those and you wind them together, you know, and then you try to break it, uh -uh. over there at the activity building, when uh, we put those lights up that are going to be up through, through um, this um, yeah. Valentine banquet, all right, we took fishing line. And I think it's 20 pound test fishing line. Well, when you stretch that from one end of that building to another and you put those lights on it, there's a lot of weight on there. So what we did is we took several strands of that and twisted it together and then put the lights on it so it doesn't break. I mean, I'm not saying I jump up and hang on it, but I mean, it's stronger when you got several together. Same way in the Christian life. We think that we can make it on our own and we fail and we fail and we fail. But when we're together, we're stronger together and we encourage one another and we lift one another up. Every time I see Tim, it, it's an encouragement to me and he strengthens me and I feed off of him. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're, we're brothers in Christ. And so, I, you know, I look around, everybody in here encourages me to help me be what I need to be for Christ. And I look and I think, man, look at what they did. Man, that's awesome. They're faithful to the Lord and it encourages me in my faith. And it's when we're alone we're by ourselves and we don't, you know, we don't have that fellowship. It's kind of like uh, the story that I told, it's been several years ago, I was preaching a message and I talked about this pastor and he went to visit this person that was out of church and hadn't been in church in a long time. 
And the pastor, before he goes and visits, he's praying. He said, God, please, I don't know what to say to him. You know, everything that I've tried to say so far has just blown back in my face. And I've tried to try to get him back in church and it just hadn't happened. And he said, I went to the man's house. It was the middle of winter. And he said, I, I go and knocked on the door and the man, come on in, you know, have a seat. And he's sitting there around the fire. And he's, he's thinking, what am I going to say to this man? What am I going to say that will help him realize he needs to be in the house of God? And then God brought it to his mind. And he went over and he grabbed one of the coals out of the fire. And he put it outside of the fire and he set that coal down. And they just sat there and watched that fire dwindle and that heat dwindle in that coal. And then the pastor, after it seemingly was almost completely gone out, the flame and the ember was almost out, he takes the prong, he picks it up, he puts it back in the fire and it begins to burn brightly again. And the church member who had not been in church in a long time, he said, Pastor, I'll see you in church Sunday. You don't have to say another word. And basically what he said is, hey, when we're together, man, we fire each other up and we encourage each other to be what we need to be for God. But when we're out on our own and we're alone, we, you know, we don't have that motivation and, and we, we burn out, you know, because we need to be in the house of God and with the people of God. And so with that being said, we live in a world today that is full of broken people. I mean, if, if I could share with you some of the things that, that even I deal with as your pastor, you'd think, Brother Wayne, I thought you were stronger than that. No, I'm not. I am, I am just as broken and, and hurt about things as you are. You know, I deal with things in my life every day. You know, think about, you know, you guys have got so many people in your family. And, you know, you may have 10 or 20 or 30 people that are in your close-knit group of your family. And I've got probably that many, too, that I would consider close in my, my family as far as my blood family, my blood kin. But then you think about 200-plus people that are in this church that constantly are on my heart and I don't I don't know how other pastors are I don't know how other pastors deal with things but when I it just, it and it's not a bad thing I'm, I'm not trying to say this to say that it is not a bad thing but it think about the burden that you have on your heart for certain people in your family and then you think about a pastor who has not just his family but he's got his other family his brothers and sisters in Christ that he prays for and that he, you know, labors alongside and tries to help and tries to encourage and tries to strengthen, you know, it is, pastors deal with broken things as well. That's what I'm trying to say. And sometimes a pastor will allow things to get a hold of them so much that they get discouraged. As a matter of fact, um, I, the other day I read a statistic that I think it said, it was either one or two out of every ten pastors that answer the call to ministry actually retire as ministers because the vast majority of them drop out of the ministry because of discouragement and because of, you know, whatever you want to put in there. Uh, moral failures or whatever it is, um, they, they drop out of the ministry, which is sad because the truth is if God calls you, you know, God doesn't call you to be a pastor and then, okay, I'm going to retire. Really, ministers never retire. They may retire full-time ministry to a certain degree because they can't keep up anymore physically or whatever. But really, a pastor doesn't retire. He just moves on to glory. Okay, And that's the way God wanted it to be and intended to be. Uh, but anyway, Ms. Dixie, you were going to say something. No, okay. I'm sorry, Ms. Tammy. When I first met Tammy, her and I met at the Cancer Center in Vanderbilt two years ago. I had just started going to church here. Mm -hmm. She has literally watched me during the years here. Yeah. The growth that I've had here in this church, because her first comment was to me when I met her in Vanderbilt was, what do you do in the church? And at that time, I was like, attend. Yeah. She was like, well, do you teach? Do you, what do you do? And I was like, <coughs> attend. Yeah. And I said, I go to Sunday school, I go to church, I go to Wednesday night, I go to Sunday night. Yeah. And so that's basically what I do. Because you don't hold any offices, you don't teach, you don't do it enough. Yeah. And she was like, why? And I said, well, I'm new. She has watched my growth. Yeah. 
and her and I have stayed friends all this time. Sure. Now she sees how loving this church is yeah. and how I do fit in. Even though she knows I'm an outsider, she knows I'm from upstate New York, blah, blah, blah. And you're weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm weird, I'm unique, I'm unique. She feels that if this church will welcome me, being an outsider, so to speak, mm -hmm. you guys will welcome anyone. Sure, absolutely. So that's why she feels so comfortable coming here now. Yeah. Isn't that what church is all supposed to be about? I mean, that you feel comfortable, that you don't feel like an outsider? That well, you exactly. right, and well, here's the thing. That's my whole point. Here's the thing, um, Gabby. Um, the church, what you just said, you know, shouldn't it be that way? Should yes, there, you should, should be comfortable in the fact that people welcome you in. What you don't need to be comfortable in is to be able to sit in a church service and hear the word of God, or the lack thereof, and be comfortable in the way that you're living. Now, if you're living for God, that's great. But if you're not living for God and you're not doing right, then you don't need to feel comfortable in church. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You ought to feel convicted. And I, I know that's where you, you were talking about the other end of that. But I was simply wanting to go both sides of the coin. Yes, you feel comfortable in the fact that you feel loved and accepted by everybody, but man, you don't want to feel comfortable when it comes to hearing God's word. You want God to speak to you and challenge you to be more than what you are. And, um, and so that's the important thing. But yes, everybody ought to be accepted in the house of God uh, because... But you want others to see your growth. Yes. We are simply broken people, you know, trying to get closer to God. And, and that's what it's all about, you know. We, um, we, we all deal with issues in our lives and we all have problems and we all have heartaches and trouble and trial and all those things. And so, but when we come together, there's just something special about gathering around the Word of God and about putting our arm around a brother or sister and about shaking hands and about saying, hey, we're all a part of the family of God. And if you're not a part of the family of God, let's, let me tell you how, to, how that can happen. You know, so that's the important thing. And uh, we need to close because people are coming in. So let's... Uh, let's close in prayer. Jimmy, close us, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this special time of worship and fellowship, all in your name. We ask that you give us love and guidance, and Lord, that we don't become complacent for where we are, that we are continuously growing in your word and mm. spreading your word to those that don't know you, and just drawing your presence closer to us. And we ask that you forgive us for anywhere we fail short of your will. We ask that you. We uh, send up a special prayer for all those that are on our prayer list, Lord, that you wrap your arms around and lift them up and give them understanding of your will in all cases, Lord, your will be done. And we know you have the perfect path laid out for us, Lord. We just ask for strength and courage to follow that path and stay true to the Word and just draw your presence closer to us every day. We ask all this in your most precious and heavenly name. Amen. 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 Yeah.